Um, yeah, the word primitive is an interesting way to get into the, um, the way that our culture and our worldview has situated and um, f obscured the meaning and importance of the indigenous phase of, of human life and human existence. Now, the word primitive initially meant that which is closest to and issued directly from the source or the origin. In other words, this would be a term that is uh, a, a very high and exalted meaning because the source, of course, is the divinity or the origin of creation. And <clears throat> the, the word somewhere be, uh, around the 17th century, the consensual meaning of the word primitive was shifted to those uh, peoples or aspects of creation that have failed to be responsive to the influences of evolution. So immediately we see this word has been changed in terms and in relationship to uh, the, the theory of evolution that was developed during this period of time. Now, this may seem like a small thing, but most of the words that we utilize, we have never actually contact with them through their lexiconal meaning. We have not looked at them, uh, the, the meaning, the, the established meaning in a dictionary. We pick up the, what we mean by words from some sort of consensus radar. Uh, and uh, the people who understand how meaning uh, of words can shift the, our internal view of reality um, were very active at the time of the uh, introduction of the Industrial Revolution and the change from traditional society in Europe into the urbanization and industrialization phase. So this word is part of a, a whole social program um, and agenda that uh, changed from a positive to a negative uh, the meaning of the word primitive. Now, this may seem like a small matter, but uh, as we know now from cognitive studies, the, the meanings of words affect us in the same way that our direct perception of reality affects us. In other words, we know that when we see a tree, for example, the the only thing that we actually receive internally of the tree is neuroelectric impulses that travel along the optic tract, or if we touch a tree along the, the nerves uh, closest to the skin in our hand. And all that uh, electrical um, fluctuations and impulses enter the brain, and somewhere in the internal chambers of the brain, an image is formed that is associated either with that electrical magnetic activity of the, uh, of the senses, or the same process of image formation takes place when we hear the word tree. Uh, image forms in our mind. So language has the same power to affect the internal image that we have of reality as does our actual sensory perception of the external world. So this is a, a very important fact, and, and people who are interested in influencing the worldview of populations or cultures uh, know that language is a direct access to that. So um, the, the philosopher Owen Barfield has studied the change of meanings of words in the English language that occurred uh, surrounding the Industrial Revolution. Um, they were all, of course, happened in relationship to a group of the actually Royal Academy of Science in England. Uh, and primitive and the, our worldview and our understanding of the indigenous world was reshaped at this time uh, and, and particularly through language and our understanding and relationship to the past.
Now, so with that as a, uh, a doorway, an entrance into uh, the rediscovering what is the true nature and true meaning of this way of life, um, from, uh, from the, that beginning of a word change, a, a shift in our internal uh, view of uh, our origins, the, in, in connection with the theory of Darwinism, there began to be circulated an idea that the indigenous period of, was a brutish period of, of um, hand-to-mouth, bloody desperation of people uh, having to spend all their time seeking food from, from a uh, hostile environment. And uh, it was brutish, it was low, it was insecure, it was unsafe. Now, what we have found out in a period, say, within the last 10 or 15 years, particularly through a branch of science <coughs> called paleopathology. These are people who take the ex exhumed remains, the skeletal remains um, of, from very old archaeological sites, and study the skeletons um, for evidence of disease, malnutrition, uh, stress, deformation of the very basic structure of the body. And, and they <coughs> have come up with um, a wealth of information that indicates that prehistoric, pre-agricultural people had far lower incidences of infectious diseases. They, our, their skeletal formation and, and particularly their teeth show that they um, uh, had far less problems with malnutrition. They were much better nourished. They were taller, stronger. Uh, an interesting thing on the formation of the spine, uh, early agricultural people all, up until this day show signs of compression and deformation in the spine due to the burdensome form of work that agriculture introduced. So. With these and other tests that in, in China and in Peru, they actually have found prehistoric feces. And the examination of that shows that, uh, that hunter and gatherers were far less uh, problems with parasitic uh, uh, intrusions into the organism. So this opened a, a crack in the egg that, uh, in terms of a very factual, you know, the kind of information that we need to have because we're impressed into the philosophy of scientism. This is empirical data that shows repeatedly that the hunter and gatherer had a much healthier, uh, better nourished uh, way of life than is evident from early agriculture. We understand then that the word primitive does not mean brutish, low, backward, degenerate, but it means that which has remained closest to the origins, to the source. And with that understanding, we can understand better the whole orientation of uh, traditional societies towards a reverence towards the past, towards a reverence towards the elders, towards a reverence towards the ancestors, because the further back we go, the closer we get to the origins. This also is a way of understanding why, in traditional cultures, children were uh, held in such high esteem. Because a child comes uh, immediately and freshly from the source, from the spirit world. And so these two characteristics, which have been made to seem to mean a culture is backward and superstitious, really is based on the understanding of the actual meaning of the word primitive, that which issues and remains closest to the origin and the source. So in this way, then, the hunters and gather uh, culture is that part of ourselves, of our own racial and, and memory of that which represents a closeness and reiteration of the origins. And Although we uh, fail to acknowledge this because we've been so orientated towards the future and because 
the way that history has been shaped for us, we actually begin our identification with, with the so-called civilization. Um, and we easily go back to Greece, and some of us have had enough um, involvement in history to recognize the value of the legacy of Egypt. But still, civilization means those who live in cities. And uh, so immediately everything previous to that is not instantly incorporated into our historical identity. So with cities, cities actually meant agriculture. And uh, agriculture meant it had a whole uh, range of implications and impacts on uh, our, our, not only our physiology, which we've talked about, but also our social structure and our social way of being. With agriculture came things like epidemics, war, uh, the control of society by a small hierarchical elite. All these things are inseparable from the act of agriculture. Um, the agricultural period, interestingly, the Gerard Diamond, the anthropologist who w first began to unearth the work of the paleopathologists, uh, said that it is evident from this point of view that agriculture is the worst mistake humanity has ever made. Uh, the very idea that land was cut off, fenced, blocked, and people had to be corralled into dense uh, population groups, and, and the establishment of fixed settlement, all of those things have had, although we've only been shown the, that this represents progress and a get great leap forward, no one would accept that war, epidemics, deep social divisions, a, the rule by a elite mi minority actually constitutes an improvement in human life or in the po potentialities of, of the human spirit. Uh, one of the major things is a great deal of social uh, inequality, protect, particularly sexual inequality. The, because city-states that had to defend large areas of agricultural land and hold possession of them, um, uh, uh, became competitive units against other de developing city-states, the process of war required that women had to be seen now as strictly as a breeding function. They had to breed increasing numbers of children in order to produce the soldiers and workers to feed the, the constant system of, of uh, agriculture and armaments and war. Uh, this, the agriculture is basic to the understanding of the subjugation of women. It's basic to the uh, idea of the subjugation and cruelty towards animals, the enslavement of the plant world. All of these things, of course, were sacrilegious to the hunter and gatherer. As you begin to look at the implications that are associated with a single change in culture, remember, culture actually means the way an organism derives its nutrient from the earth. Uh, the culture in scientific terms, we have a very wide and loose definition of the term, but culture actually means the way that people draw nourishment from the earth. You can get that more from a scientific definition. A culture is a, 
prepared nutritive medium in which a particular organism thrives. And in a wider sense, that's what culture is. And there are four basic cultures. The first, the primary culture, is the hunter and gathering culture. The um, hunter uh, expresses the masculine aspect of the culture. Okay, so we want to go back to start. Four. Remember to look at me. Okay, so that. Okay. Hold on, hold on. Okay. And. Can we So once we understand that definition of culture as being the basic relationship that we have with the earth, the way the earth feeds us, the way we derive our nourishment from the earth, and that th this process, this relationship to the earth has taken four distinctly different forms. The original one was the hunter and gatherer. We should actually say the gatherer and hunter because the uh, nutriments of the indigenous uh, people were basically vegetables, uh, wild vegetables that women gathered. Uh, and the hunting was done more ritualistically and completely in tune with the spirit of the species that was sacrificed for uh, a particular relationship to a place uh, and a ceremonial um, performance of the spirit energies that formed and made that place. So the first culture gathers and hunters, the male and female aspect are completely woven and integrated, each having their own function and yet merged in a totality. Then due to climate factors or we can go into a number of things uh, such as earth changes, the, that initial culture broke up into and actually is represented in the myths of, as the separation of the two sexes. The male uh, hunter gradually transformed into the male animal herder and, uh, and a nomadic culture. And there's evidence still of each one of these forms of culture. And the feminine went to very uh, small, settled horticultural villages. Uh, this evidence of this uh, prehistoric culture has recently been uh, explored by uh, Maria Gambutis, the, the great uh, uh, woman uh, a anthropologist and archaeologist, and it has begun a whole surge, become part of femini f the feminist world, uh, reshaping the worldview after patriarchy, that there were a, a completely matriarchal period of human history. So the, those villages, particularly in Anatolia and uh, Chattahoya, they um, were f feminine dominated and they were basically the knowledge and understanding of plants uh, that was uh, gathered during the early indigenous phase. While the, the male, his um, aptitudes towards the hunt led him to controlling the uh, animal herds that he used to previously hunt. So then we have three of those <coughs> cultures, the original breaking into two, the masculine and, and feminine, and then at, in the Middle East uh, at the time that we uh, recognize as civilization, these two merged again sometimes <clears throat> and most uh, frequently under masculine domination. The animal herder male became the kings and rulers over the settled uh, aspects of the previous feminine culture. And th that merger has led to what we call civilization or the city-state. Um, so 
All of this is based on agriculture and the domestication of animals. The whole turn of history, culture really turned around the basic, the simple, uh, seemingly simple uh, function of how we derive food from the earth. Now remember, food, uh, it, it has lost all its spiritual uh, meaning and importance, but food is the basic sacrifice upon which this entire creation is built. Um, every uh, living species requires the sacrifice of the life of another species or form in order to perpetuate its own life. So something must give its energy and its life to perpetuate another. And that's basically the meaning of sacrifice and of, of, of uh, the, the, the fundamental aspect of, of sacred and spiritual. So the Aborigines, in acknowledging the, uh, and the indigenous culture, acknowledge that the entire creation was an interwoven process of sacrifice in which one gives to the other, but it is one life form and one consciousness feeding and living through another form. So that whole sacredness of the act of the exchange of energy through nourishment, through eating, was, had to be lost because agriculture meant you are no, no longer entering into a harmonic reciprocal ex, ex, exchange with, a, uh, a, with the forces of consciousness and life of the entire creation. You are now exploiting, you are controlling, subjugating the two kingdoms uh, of animal and plant to th and for the purposes of human development alone. Perhaps um, the difference the, of that shift from hunting and gathering to agriculture can be summed up in a um, story that I read uh, by the anthropologist Ronald Barrett of an Aboriginal uh, tribal woman who walked by one day when a, a white missionary was in his garden struggling over the broken tomato plants which were dehydrating in the sun and being eaten by insects and, and uh, going through all the frustrations of, of um, controlled uh, food source. And she said, why do you go through all this trouble? I, I'm paraphrasing, I hope I can remember it uh, in essence. She said, Basically, we depend on the same thing. We need sunlight and we need rain to bring forth nourishment from the earth, but we trust that the ancestors have left the food for us that is uh, appropriate and meant for our, for our uh, life and for our, our nourishment. And we only have to walk through the world to find where that food has been left for us. That way, we don't need any of the, these problems, these fences, and uh, this struggle to grow uh, what we think is our food. We trust that our food has been left on earth for us. And that whole idea of, of that trusting in nature, the idea that uh, every creature that is born onto earth, its food is also there. That basic understanding of the earth as a, as a nutritive uh, maternal field that is there to support life um, and to support actually its spiritual growth. Because um, as it has been pointed out, the imperative in indigenous culture is not the concern over sustenance. The imperative is religious and artistic ceremony, the celebration of the experience of being embodied. Uh, and I think just in that little, that, that reflection of that Aboriginal woman is, is, the, is the entire key because the principle of their culture then becomes not imprisoning space and imprisoning movement 
uh, as civilization, as urbanization does, setting boundaries and limits. But the principle of the culture is simply walking. Their, their religion was based on moving through a free, open space and enjoying the mystery and beauty of a world that is untouched and undisturbed uh, by the presence of any form of life. Um, it's very interesting, the bipedal motion of uh, walking uh, the human organism is the only organism whose neuromuscular system is wired so that walking actually is a spiraling motion. The upper part of the body pivots in one direction while the lower pelvic pivots in another. And there's no other uh, neuro neuromuscular system in any animal that is wired in this inverse reciprocal motion. So what the neuromuscular movement of, of walking actually does around the spinal column is to set up a, an imploding vortex of, of um, bioenergetic field, actually. And it's not when it's standing still, it's only when walking. So walking and dancing are the fundamental ground of Aboriginal culture, not the struggle to provide the sustenance and basis of life. And that's a, that's a major psychological and psycho-spiritual shift in the orientation of between agriculture and um, hunting and gathering. No matter what aspect of life uh, or existence you look, the, the profound impact of this cultural shift is, is imprinted in every aspect of our life. Uh, in a practical sense, the hunting and gathering culture usually has a population distribution of one person per every square mile, while uh, to contrast that with even rural uh, farming uh, situation, it's a hundred times higher than, than that, where you have a hundred people per every uh, 10 square miles. Now this is to, not to include anything about urban density or suburban density. So anyone who knows and experiences the kind of inner freedom one ex has just through the experience of open space, of, of space in which you can sense the, uh, aloneness and direct relationship with your environment. This, the f openness of space is very important for that kind of experience. Um, on, a, on a more uh, physiological level, it's very one of the most prominent or contrasting uh, bits of evidence was the remains of prehistoric indigenous people that were exhumed from the region of Turkey and Greece. Now these, prior to agriculture, the skeletal frames of both men and women were five to six inches taller than those skeletons that were found uh, following the introduction of settled uh, fixed settlement and agriculture. Um, that, that means it was not only uh, had to do with nutrition, but that the skeletons themselves had been compressed and deformed by the burden of labor, labor the sort of self-subjugation that agriculture uh, represents. In other words, you have to, uh, the, the transformation of the mystic, the hunter, the dancer, the wandering uh, indigenous nomad into the builder, the farmer, the, the, uh, the, the unskilled worker. Uh, and <clears throat> this 
change is, is in vocation reflects a whole change in, in, in spiritual identity of the entire race. Uh, another really interesting aspect of this is that, and it, it touches upon something that's very key to us, the idea of individuality. Uh, we have come to, uh, been conditioned to believe that individuality is a flowering of the, uh, the civilized and technological growth of humanity. But to the contrary, in, it has been proven in almost every indigenous hunting and gathering culture, children, by the time they're three to four years old, are completely independent for their own food. In other words, they walk along with a group and they get their own berries and roots and by that time they've already learned because of their constant companionship with their mother in the first few years of life, they know where their food is and they are independent. They need no uh, reliance on the system or on their parents to feed themselves. Now, if, if you want to be practical on this, the idea of sensing oneself as an independent, autonomous individual uh, is, you know, it's, it's, it's paradoxical to think that we who are completely dependent upon a system for our, our, the very simple basics of life could ever actually achieve the individuality of a people who, by three or four, could be lost in the wilderness for weeks and could feed themselves. As a matter of fact, the adolescent initiation in many indigenous cultures um, requires that bo both the male and female go into the wilderness by themselves and live totally uh, on their own resources and on the skills that they have acquired in, in terms of, of deriving their sustenance directly from nature. And most of those processes are spiritual processes. The, they, the Aborigines of Australia, for example, did not follow wall, wallaby or kangaroo herds. Their walking, their movements were dictated by the mythological song lines. In other words, they traveled uh, uh, the routes and paths throughout Australia. And some of these tribes, it's proven, have walked the entire circumference and through the interior of the entire continent of Australia. And those walks are guided by following stories, creation stories, about how certain areas were created, and when they arrive at these places, they have, as I said, the imperative of ritual, a dance, and art. They re-perform and reiterate the story of creation in a ceremonial um, performance. So their food was a food that was presented there in relationship to the story, what was offered by the earth. Uh, in response not to the, a, a practical um, uh, calculating uh, relationship to hunting down a prey, but just receiving what was there. In some places they would go to mountaintops during a time where a butterfly was uh, going through its um, uh, formation and release into its, its uh, form of flight, its insect form, and they would eat just butterflies and moths that were there by the thousands. So if you take out that practical uh, hunter and prey, and you realize that, it, and this has been verified by anthropologists, very often the kangaroo uh, herds would follow the aborigines because kangaroos love the music and dance. Uh, <clears throat> So if you have a, a situation where people are celebrating life through ceremony and in the process a, a child is already independent 
for sustenance at three or four years of age, here is a, a condition in which individuality is really based on a physical truth, a physical foundation. Um, in this case, then, their allegiance, their sense of belonging to a group is not based on need and interdependency as we experience, uh, because they're free to go by themselves at any time, but they're drawn to the group and to interrelationship out of the love and joy of kinship, out of the patterns of exchange um, and interaction, not out of dependency and, and uh, obligation and responsibility based on, on need. So these are all nuances, uh, but they're very profound uh, internally and externally in the, in the shift that happened. So in a certain sense, uh, many people have realized that the expulsion from the garden, the introductory story of the book of Genesis, is basically the end, uh, a, a symbolic way of depicting the end of the hunting and gathering era or cycle of humanity. When the, the earth really, the entire earth was a garden. Uh, and of course the early books of, of, um, of the Hebrews, the early testaments of, of Moses are about expunging the, the indigenous people of the area in, in which the, the tribes of Israel moved in and co colonized the area of Canaan. And there is a great emphasis on the importance of destroying and obliterating even the memory of this way of life. Uh, this way of life that is symbolized perhaps by the serpent who the earth or telluric energy who whispers in the ear of the feminine, the memory of the previous phase of um, our existence. But I, I think it's important that no matter how we, deeply embedded we are in terms of our individual life in, in urbanization, in the technological, uh, the civilized process, all of us can have somewhere I, in our racial memory, the, the uh, core, the seed, the essence of having at one time passed through the indigenous phase. And this memory, this, this deep recollection is, I think, at this phase in which there is so, so much potential of termination, the memory of our beginning has holds a very specific and important profundity.